I, I think sort of many of these uh, many of these uh, challenges that we've discussed uh, also apply in the higher education context, where um, you know it's it's probably uh, the, you know if you define technology as doing more with uh, less, um, education is perhaps the most anti-technological aspect of our society today, where uh, you're getting the same at a higher and higher price. Right. Uh, you know the, the the real costs of higher education since 1980 have gone up about 400 percent. It's after inflation, uh, and uh, and uh, it's not clear the quality's gone up at all. It's uh, the, uh, bizarre. What do you think well, about it's it? it's on some level uh, on some level the universities have found that they can just charge more every year, and uh, and I think uh, and so I think the you know the question is maybe why has there not been more resistance to these right. these price hikes, and I think it again in part goes to this failure of an imagination of an alternate future. And so uh, talented people should all go to the same universities, learn the same things, uh, uh, pursue the same uh, types of careers. We have, a, you know, if we had an internet bubble or a housing bubble, we certainly have an education uh, bubble today. And it has, uh, it is, um, you know, bubbles are characterized by um, things costing more than they're worth. They're characterized by sort of intense psychosocial dynamics. So it's um, it's very hard for people to suggest that you should not go to a, the best college you can get into right. because people don't know what else to do. So it's again this sort of failure of imagination of an alternate future. Um, and it's also, bubbles are also characterized by abstractions away from reality. And, uh, and so I think the word education itself um, is this incredible abstract filler. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's worth you know, drilling down a lot more on what is going on, and that's the sort of thing you're generally not allowed to do. So, what is it specifically that you're learning? Right. So, uh, you know, engineering is it some rigorous humanities course, or is it just education in the abstract? Um, and uh, you know, I've often suggested you could you could think of uh, you think of this in economic terms. You can think of is education an investment decision, where it's basically uh, something you invest to get a better paying job. Is it a consumption decision where it's sort of a four-year party, um, and uh, maybe uh, maybe it's sort of a combination of a bad investment and bad consumption decision where basically uh, people think they are investing by consuming, which was characteristic of the housing bubble where you bought an especially large house with a swimming pool and you patted yourself on the back for being an incredibly frugal investor, right. and uh, and so there's sort of an aspect of that. But I've come to think that uh, even more than investment or consumption. Um, it's perhaps better to think of um, education as uh, understood as an insurance policy, where it's uh, it's probably not worth as much as people are paying for it, but they're scared of falling through the cracks in our society, and so as the cracks get bigger, we pay more and more for uh, for insurance against it. That's the way it's advertised, and then I think the reality is that it's the exact opposite of an insurance policy. It is actually sort of this this crazy zero sum tournament in which. Um, in which what really matters is getting into the best schools, and then um, a diploma from a third-tier university um, is really a dunce hat in disguise. And so, um, and so uh, there is. So I think at, at its core, it's perhaps a, a, um, a zero-sum tournament um, masquerading as as, uh, as general insurance, and that's that's incredibly dissonant. And can it be changed? I mean, as long as I've been, <clears throat> I came here to work in the education department. We thought higher ed was ripe for change, and it doesn't look very different now than it did 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, the tone, historically, I think the tone has been set by the, the top universities. They have uh, these enormously uh, rich endowments, and uh, they are incredibly resistant to, uh, to influence from the outside. And, uh, and so I do, think, I do think it's the kind of thing that's very hard to reform uh, from, uh, from without. It is, um, it is nevertheless, I think, Heading towards a crisis of sorts, where uh, it simply no longer works for um, the vast majority of uh, middle-class students who are amassing enormous amounts of debt uh, going to college, and so there is going to be uh, enormous pressure. It's 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 hard to say exactly what the timing on this is, but I think some of the online alternatives, um, you know, are going to get more traction as these uh, as these financial pressures start to mount. Um, you know, one of my uh, one of my friends has characterized uh, um, the university system as uh, as the atheist church, which is sort of a successor to the 
Catholic Church. It's sort of universal, um, and uh, and that the university system in 2014, it's like the Catholic Church circa 1514. Um, there's less diversity, so you have know, the Dominicans and the Franciscans and all right, these different right. orders, whereas the diversity between, say, the Harvard and Stanford political science department is considerably less. Um, but it is sort of, uh, you have this priestly class of professors that doesn't, that, uh, doesn't do very much work. Uh, people are buying indulgences in the form of uh, amassing enormous debt for the sort of uh, secular salvation that a, a diploma uh, represents. And, um, and what I think is very similar to, uh, to uh, the 16th century is that the Reformation will come largely from outside. It will, uh, um, and then, you know, at some point, Maybe there will be some, you know, internal need to adapt. Right. But I think the first move will will have to come from outside, because uh, you have sort of systems that are so far decoupled from from what 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 actually makes sense, uh, and the people are so um, they're so uh, bought into a system that's that right. does just does not work. That uh, that I, I, th I think you will see enormous resistance from the faculty. And the, I think it seems to me it's a combination of sort of bureaucratic bureaucratic sloth, I guess, and um, resistance to change on the one hand and then the political correctness on the other. And I guess they go together more than perhaps people, some people focus on political correctness, mm -hmm. the more ideological critics of higher education, the financial critics, you know, focus on the self-perpetuating uh, tenure system and and uh, endless growth, apparently, bureaucracy and cost. But I, I suspect there's some relationship of those two. Well, there's, um, there is a, Incredible conformity, um, and there's a, um, and there is, and sort of the questions of how are you training people to uh, to think in uh, in different uh, ways um, have have really uh, gotten lost sight of. I I think um, I think it is striking how little of a focus there is on teaching yeah. in in general, and uh, and you know there is sort of the subtle point where something goes from a not great system. Into an all-out racket, where uh, does it? How much sense does it make for professors to really invest in their graduate students and PhD programs when there's a sense that none of these people will get jobs anymore anyway? Right. And so th I, I think you are sort of in this in this zone of where uh, it has, in many ways, become this uh, this incredible racket, and it's 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 it it is hard to really know what people inside it think. And I think just objectively, people say it's the greatest, it's the best system ever. And but just as an obvious matter, people are not as well educated today as they were the elites, at least, 70 or 80 years ago. People know fewer languages, they memorize less poetry, they're less familiar with history and just literature. I mean, just in very obvious ways, someone graduating, uh, certainly from European universities, but maybe from American universities as well, just uh, seems to me ha had a better education. Leaving entirely aside politics, here, yes, uh, well, today, which is a sort of amazing. Th you think someone should be able, and, uh, and that strikes me as also ripe for challenge. If someone set themselves up and said, "We're going to really educate," this would be K through 12 too, obviously, we're going to provide a real education. Mm -hmm. There's no reason young people in 2014 should be less well educated than a young person was in 1914. But it's evidently the case in many ways, you know. Yes. Well, the uh, there is sort of an egalitarian assumption embl embedded. In education, where uh, where it's assumed um, that everyone is more or less the same, yes, and therefore, um, if you look at how well do people do who graduate from Harvard versus people who just have a high school diploma, and let's say they make twice as much money per year if they graduate from Harvard as with a high school diploma, um, it's assumed that this is prima facie evidence of how um, great the Harvard education is. When I think the reality is much more that it's a super selective. A selection of factors, their selection, their signaling, um, relatively little, a uh, sort of value-added learning. But uh, because we have this egalitarian mindset, it's it's sort of hard to make the argument that it is just um, this uh, the selection rather than a value-added learning. Um, you know, the obvious uh, the obvious way to illustrate this would be if you said that the top universities in the U.S. were doing as good a job as they claim. The most natural thing for them to do would be to increase enrollment. So if you say you have 1,600 people a year going to Harvard and we're, do, we're offering them a fantastic education that's making them much better than they otherwise would have been, you know, I mean, could, you, could you sort of have some structured growth plan where you increase that number to maybe 3,000 over 20 years? 
Uh, certainly the population of the country is a lot larger. Right. It's, uh, it's attracting people from all over the world. And so, um, so if you're offering such a great education, what sort of a product is it that, um, where you wouldn't increase the number of people who use it? I mean, I think the only, the only product I can think of where you would limit access as much would be a nightclub, <laughs> which, is, which, is a, which is sort of, uh, again, a zero-sum product right. that's based on exclusion. And I think that if you went to any of these top universities and you proposed doubling the enrollment, um, you would get a uniform opposition from the alumni, from the current students, from the faculty, because it would, they would rightly right. perceive that it would make it less prestigious, even though that, that sort of goes very much against this egalitarian ethos that everyone's the same. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good contrarian point of view that you're taking there on, on higher education. Well, I, think, I think the rhetoric around education is always that it's a positive sum game, because right. there's this naive intuition that, you know, knowledge, uh, if I know something and I teach it to you, we both will know it, and so there's something about knowledge that's fundamentally this incredibly positive sum aspect, and I think it masks the uh, the very zero sum aspect of uh, of education. I mean, I went to I went to uh, law school, and if you look at the law schools, it's you know there's this brutal ranking on the U.S. News and World Report scale, okay. where uh, you know the top three I think are still very good. So if you go to Harvard, Stanford, or Yale, that's really good. Then I think there's sort of four after that that are pretty good and then there's sort of the numbers 8 to 14 where maybe if you're in the top half of the class and then probably numbers 15 to 200 um, it's uh, it's very unclear whether um, it's a positive value for anybody who goes or for bottom 90 percent of those classes. When I've, I, when I've looked at this I think in the 1980s and 1990s one saw uh, rapidly escalating costs in education but also increasing inequality in our society and so there, it was at least correlated. It was always worth going to the top college because right. you'd, you'd make more money and it would sort of seemingly make up for it. Um, post 2000, even though there still is a vast gulf between high school graduates and college graduates, it stopped widening. The costs have kept going up and so, uh, so the relative value of a college education has actually been going down since about 2000. If you say we're to measure the value of a college education by how many years does it take you to pay off your debt? The number of years was actually going down in the 80s and 90s because the premium was going up even faster than the costs were escalating. Post 2000, it's taking longer and longer to pay off the debt. So the, the actually the relative premium has been in decline for for 14 years now. And I think again, 2008 was a was a bit of a watershed moment where um, where all of a sudden uh, there were sort of a lot fewer of these tracked positions available. Uh, you know, when when uh, kids graduate from college and move back in with their parents. That was not part of the deal the parents had implicitly signed. It's, it's, it's incredibly distorted. Um, you know, it's uh, one, of the things that's, uh, one of the things that uh, makes the education bubble different from, say, the housing or the, or the tech bubble of, of the last decades is that it is actually very hard to measure what the quality of, of education is. And so when people say things like, you'll figure it out in 20 years, there are things you will learn that are intangible that will help you 20 years in the future, you know, somewhat cynical cut on that might be that, uh, well, this is the sort of thing you say if you're running a scam where you want to have a really long right. shelf life to it so people won't notice that they've been defrauded for a long time. But uh, there is something about the um, immeasurability of education that's made the uh, education bubble um, quite durable. But on the other hand, that it probably also means that it's gotten bigger and bigger in a way that's, um, that's extremely distorted.